Western banks are raking in the profits from their businesses in Russia and contributing hundreds of millions to the country's coffers in the process. Joining me to discuss this is Bill Browder, a financier with many years of experience working in Russia and speaking out against the government there. So, Bill, thank you very much for joining us. I just want to start by getting your initial reaction to this story. Are you surprised or is this simply on brand for European banks? Well, first of all, let's just look at what's going on. Uh, Putin started a war in February 2022 an illegal invasion of Ukraine. He's killed hundreds of thousands of people, Ukrainian soldiers, Ukrainian civilians, um, caused hundreds of billions of dollars of damage to the country. And the Western world has reacted by saying this is unacceptable, sanctions have been imposed, assets have been frozen across the board. And in the midst of all this, um, there are these European banks um, that are earning billions of dollars in the midst of this, and then paying hundreds of millions of dollars of taxes to the Russian government. That's just highly immoral, totally inappropriate. It goes against the geo, uh, geostrategic security interests of Europe. It goes against morality, and it's got to stop. Okay, let's zoom in on this a bit. So according to data collected by the Financial Times, banks such as Raffeisen, Unicredit, Deutsche Bank, Commerzbank, and others reported 3 billion euros in profit in their Russian operations and paid 800 million euros in taxes to Russia. And that's up from 200 million from before the war. Now, the banks would say that they can't move their assets out of the country due to Russian rules. So they keep controlling them as responsible custodians or else they would have to abandon them and in process give them up to Putin's government. Do you agree with that perspective, with that argument? Well, so what we've seen is the war started. Um, there was tremendous pressure on many com companies, banks, other other businesses to um, uh, withdraw from Russia. Hundreds, if not thousands of businesses did withdraw from Russia. So um, that argument didn't work for most people. And then a few remained. And they came up with all sorts of what I would describe as mealy mouth um, explanations for continuing to earn these profits. And let's just look at the bottom line here. $800 million of taxes paid to the Russian government was used, that money was used, to purchase weapons to kill Ukrainians. It's effectively enabling war crimes to be committed. And um, uh, I think they shouldn't, shouldn't be there in the first place. And I think that any profits that are generated um, from, from Russia, money that they've, that they've withdrawn from Russia, uh, should be used to fund the Ukrainian defense effort. Um, this is totally inappropriate, totally immoral, and, and uh, an outrageous insult um, to all the people uh, of, of Europe, the United Kingdom, United States, who are taxpayers who are paying money um, to fund Ukraine to fight back. Well, we contacted the European bank with the most invested in Russia, Raff Eisenbank, and they had this to say. They say, RBI has not yet succeeded in withdrawing from Russia. This is due to the special framework conditions which make a sale very difficult. And while RBI is working on a deconsolidation, it is reducing its business activity in Russia. Since the beginning of the war, the loan volume has decreased by 58%. Now, back to you, Bill. You were talking about mealy-mouthed responses. What's your response to that specific statement? Well, based on, on the numbers reported in the FT, the, the aggregate um, profits, or actually the aggregate taxes of, of um, these uh, banks paid to the Russian government has increased 400%. So I don't buy it. Um, it just sounds like nonsense produced by in-house PR people and lawyers to try to cover up effectively the um, uh, 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 a situation where where they're they're in collusion with a with a criminal dictatorship to commit crimes because I I, I do not buy the fact that that they couldn't withdraw. Other people have. Other people have taken their money out. Other people have taken huge losses on their money on their investments in Russia. It just sounds completely inappropriate, um, insincere, and um, and I think that there should be some policy response to this. So um, what action do you think should be taken then? So if the companies themselves aren't willing to give up their Russian businesses, what should be done? I think that there should be some type of effective windfall tax on any, any company 
uh, operating in Russia where that money, where that windfall tax is specially allocated um, to the defense of Ukraine. And is there the political will to take that kind of action? Because we've seen, for example, in the EU, it's taken a long time to find agreement on action to either take against Russia. Some Early on, it went quickly. But since then, there's been a slowdown in the EU's response. So is there even the political will to take that action? And if not, then what options are left on the table? Well, part of the problem is that, that within the EU, um, so let's take Raiffeisen, which is the biggest beneficiary of all this blood money from Russia. Um, Raiffeisen is supported by their government. And, and with, within the EU, in order to take a policy decision, it requires uh, unanimity when it comes to foreign policy. And so I can imagine a situation where the Austrian government would intervene on behalf of their bank um, and veto any decision. And so it becomes very complex, very difficult. Um, and, and I think that there is some, some argument to be made um, that the U.S. Treasury should get involved and the U.S. Treasury should should think about imposing sanctions if these people continue to profit from Russian blood money. Okay, so absolutely taking a tough line on them. But then what's your message to the boards of these banks? What would you tell them directly if you were in those boardrooms right now? What I, what I would tell them directly is that there are a lot of people that are very upset about what they're doing and are going to be looking for policy actions and punishments for what they're doing. And the punishments should not just apply to the banks, but it should apply to the decision makers within those banks. And those individuals uh, should understand that people like me and other many others are very upset and are looking, gonna look for consequences. Okay, now speaking of, of consequences, but looking more to the past in your book, Freezing Order, you mentioned the Russian laundromat scandal where banks are found in Europe, European banks were found to be aiding in Russian money laundering and how you facilitated a journalistic investigation into Danske Bank specifically. Um, since this entire war has, has broken out, since Russia invaded Ukraine, um, has that changed the, dynam the dynamics on that? Have the investigations moved the needle on that? Is the era of funneling illicit funds via Europe now over? Well, it's very interesting because it's, it's, a, it's a mixed picture. Um, on one hand, you had, for example, as you mentioned, Dansky Bank, which was one of the huge, huge launderers of dirty Russian money in years past via their Estonian branch, and that's completely stopped. I think we've also seen Latvia and Lithuania, which, which had banks that were doing money laundering, that stopped. And I think we've also seen Cyprus stop. But strangely, um, uh, uh, Austria, as you mentioned in the beginning of your report, hasn't stopped. That uh, Raiffeisen Bank is deep and in, deep in, up to their neck in this stuff. And so it's a mixed picture. Um, it's definitely harder for Russians to move dirty money around. Um, they have a few uh, European banks that they can collude with. They also you work with banks in Dubai, banks in Turkey, banks in Armenia, Kazakhstan. Um, and of course, they work with cryptocurrency. Um, I would hope that, that um, all of these opportunities um, eventually get shut down, because the only way that we're going to stop this war is to starve Putin of his financial resources. And the Putin and his uh, KGB colleagues are out there always um, looking for alternative paths for their money, because this is, at the end of the day, a war of resources. And the resources that Russia has are oil and gas and metals, and then they generate cash, and then the cash needs to be used to buy things. And if we can cut that off, then they won't have the, the ability to wage this war. But that requires a lot of effort and it requires um, a, a, a very consistent approach by Western governments to stop these funneling, to stop these uh, flows of money. Yeah, though I, I should say though, I'm sure Raf Eisen would dispute any involvement in Russian money laundering specifically as separate from its activities in Russia, just to make that clear, because that's what I focus the question on. Um, but your point notwithstanding, of course, something that you mentioned, one of the reasons that the banks are doing so well is the buoyant Russian economy. But much of the growth in GDP is government spending on the military. So you could call it a sugar rush in the economy, that there's nothing behind it. Is the state of the Russian economy at the moment sustainable? Well, so first of all, we, we have to understand that um, where do we get the information that the Russian economy is growing? We get it from Russia. Russia lies in every other area um, 
of, of activity. There's no reason to believe that the economic statistics being generated by the Russian State Statistics Committee. Though, though it is it is believable accurate. that the government is pouring massive amounts of money into the military. So that, of course, would boost GDP. Yeah. But it doesn't say that the economy, the underlying economy, is healthy. Um, we've seen, um, for example, an, an increase in in exports in certain areas. You can't necessarily just directly trust the Russian export data, but you can look at imports from other countries. So there are there are ways of determining that more or less. Um, that the Russian economy at the moment, just based on, purely on the figures, is doing reasonably well, certainly better than people thought it would. But perhaps underneath the surface, there's a completely different story. What's your thought? Well, it's, it's a totally different story under the surface. So first of all, one of the main uh, exports of Russia um, was the export of natural gas to Europe. Now, Russia made their own decision to cut off the natural gas to Europe, and specifically Germany, but many other countries as well. And, and the natural gas sales to Europe accounted for a huge proportion of Russian government uh, revenues, of tax revenues, and that's been cut off. Uh, we also have uh, more than $300 billion of Russian central bank reserves, which are frozen, and there's now lots of talk about confiscating that money. There's hundreds of billions of dollars of a Russian oligarch money, which has been frozen in the West. Russian banks are cut off from the SWIFT payment system. Russian, uh, all Russian companies and Russian government no longer has access to the international capital markets. Um, with the exception of these banks and some other businesses, most Western businesses have fled Russia. A million um, able-bodied, um, smart Russian men have fled the country to avoid the draft. Um, this is not an economy in good shape. This is an economy that's that's really sort of uh, stilted in, in all sorts of ways. And as you say, um, to the extent that it hasn't there hasn't been a catastrophe, um, is because they've taken whatever money they can generate from the sale of oil, which which they've been selling in large quantities to India and China and various places like that, and then they take that money and they spend it um, either on weapons in North Korea and Iran, or they spend it domestically on on military production and on soldiers and so on. And so whatever numbers, and I would argue that the economy is not growing. I think that they're making those numbers up, but to the extent that it's not catastroph catastrophically shrinking, it's because of this military spending. Okay. And so you think that, for example, the replacement of essential parts through imports to third party countries, so for example, Germany exporting to Kazakhstan, which then gets sent to Russia. So this supply of essential needs for its economy, and also, like you mentioned, sales of energy products to India, to uh, China as well. All of this is not able to mask the problems that are happening underneath the surface. This goes nowhere near, and it's also, of course, still sending um, some fossil fuels to, to, to Europe still. It's not entirely cut off if we look at uh, oil, for example. So this doesn't make up for it, is what you're saying, that, and that actually the, the core of the economy is rotten. It's, it's totally rotten. I mean, the, the, uh, the economy wasn't in great shape before all this started. The economy was very, very heavily weighted towards resource exports. They didn't have that small and medium-sized enterprises in any kind of meaningful way. Um, and now a lot of that export um, economy is getting stifled. You have we've we've successfully cut off their ability to sell diamonds, for example. That's one area that we're not that sensitive about. the o The oil price cap is a is a joke. That 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 price cap doesn't really work. Um, but their own self inflicted wound of not being able to sell gas based on their own uh, decision um, has been terrible for for the Russian economy. And so it's it's hard to look at the Russian economy and come up with any kind of um, reasonable um, prognosis other than it started out as a stilted economy and now it's in a much worse position. They're never going to be able to re reestablish their market for gas in Europe, which is a hugely important part of the economy. Europe is done with Russia. Europe is going to diversify from Russia, it has diversified. Germany in particular has diversified. And so I think that they're uh, really in, in not, not a good good place. And we could make them in a, in a much worse place if we had the wherewithal to stop all of this uh, sanctions evasion, or you know, in in this particular case, um, Western companies enabling uh, Putin and and his economy. Okay, um, I want to kind of look at things from the the other side of the equation now. So, how has Russia's war in Ukraine changed the shape of the European uh, economy over the past couple of years? You touched on a few points there, so it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on that. 
Well, it's, it's, it's very interesting because um, uh, I've, I've been involved in, in advocating for sanctions uh, since 2009 when Sergei Magnitsky, my lawyer, was murdered by the Russian state. And I tried to get consequences imposed on Russia through, the, through what's now called the Magnitsky Act. And the U.S. passed the Magnitsky Act in 2012, um, and uh, UK did in two, or Canada did 2017, UK in 2018. But it took it took until 2020 for Europe to do it because Europe is very slow on the uptake on all this stuff. But what's interesting is that since the war has started, when the first wave of sanctions started to come out against oligarchs and Russian companies and so on, Europe was actually, in a certain way, more um, robust than the United States and more robust than the UK. Europe had the, a better uh, list of oligarchs to sanction, um, a better overall sanctions program, I would argue. And then Germany, for example, you know, went from being a, a total Russian enabler, you know, building the North Stream pipeline even after <clears throat> Russia took Crimea, um, to being a country that that switched almost immediately from buying Russian gas. I think 42% of Germany's gas came from Russia to zero percent buying gas from the Qataris in America, etc. Germany also went from being a country that didn't do any any defense uh, exports uh, to uh, uh, exporting a lot of weapons to Ukraine, um, and so it's it's changed it's changed the nature of, of Europe completely. Now it hasn't changed it in a way where um, it's fully functional. You still see a lot of a lot of dysfunction, but um, Europe is on the front line. If if Putin succeeds in in Ukraine, then he's going to make a move on on the Baltics. Which are NATO members, and if he succeeds on the Baltics, which he which he may very well do, if NATO doesn't uphold its treaty obligations, if America steps aside, which could happen if Trump is president, um, then the next stop is Poland, and then it's Germany, and so this is a real uh, a real war that has real impact on on Europeans, and so Europe has has woken up now. Not has it woken up enough. Uh, in my opinion, no. I think there's a lot more waking up to do, but it's it's a lot different than it was, uh, you know, three three and a half years ago. Um, I think everyone understands that that um, Russia uh, has has malign intent, and that intent goes well beyond Ukraine. That that brings me to my final question. We're seeing among certain political leaders, certain commentators. Um, I don't know even if, if war fatigue is the right way to put it, because that kind of, um, I mean, for for these countries that have had all of these economic issues in Europe in the past few years, there's been grumblings about the billions and billions of support pledged to Ukraine, of bolstering their own security as well, spending on, on the military. Can Europe afford to give more? Well, th th there's two questions. Um, because uh, Europe will, will be, will, it will cost Europe literally a hundred times more if, if Europe is at war with Russia than, than the cost right now. And so it's a question of paying now or paying a lot, lot more later. And some people may not realize that, others do, but that's the reality. All right. Bill Browder from Hermitage Capital, thank you very much for that very insightful interview. Thanks so much. Thank you.